The Old Testament lesson for the ninth Sunday after Pentecost is taken from the 55th chapter of Isaiah. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, my sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle is taken from the ninth chapter of Romans. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you now to rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. This text also serves as the basis for the message this evening. Now, when Jesus heard about the death of John, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over, and those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. very opening verse of our Gospel reading today began by saying that when Jesus heard about the death of John, that he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. And of course, the John that's being referred to is John the Baptist, who is Jesus' friend, as well as his relative, as you might recall. And you may remember, too, that if you back up just a little bit into the text, you find out the circumstances under which John was put to death. It had been at King Herod's birthday party. A banquet was was held. And in the course of that banquet, as we get to the conclusion of it, uh, you have this grisly scene where John the Baptist's head is cut off and it's brought in on a platter. And then it's handed over to... Herod's stepdaughter, who then takes it to her mother, who had it in for John. So the text immediately following is the one that we have today, and it really stands in contrast to that. It seems that that Matthew is, in some sense, intentionally contrasting this this rather uh, grisly scene that we have at this birthday banquet of Herod with now something very different provided by Jesus, the true king, to his people as he in his mercy and grace feeds thousands. And you might have noticed it said 5,000 men, but then it says this was, uh, uh, along with that, the women and children who were there too. So this is a vast crowd of people. Well, something that stands out about this is that you got this huge crowd of people, but it's at a very time when Jesus was actually trying to withdraw. So it says he goes to this desolate place, he's by himself with his disciples. 
And this could be because maybe he's going there to mourn the death of John. It could be because of the, the political and the religious tensions that are rising. And we see this in the death of John. And Jesus knows it's not his time yet. The cross is coming, but it's not yet. And so it could be that Jesus is withdrawing a bit because of that reason. Or it could just be, as we find in other occasions, Jesus is withdrawing because of his own, just his, his physical need for rest and, and a time of prayer and a time to seclude himself a bit with his disciples as he gets ready for the next stage of ministry. But whatever the case is, when he gets there, there's no rest for Jesus. There is no privacy for him. There's this huge crowd of people, and they are there with their sick loved ones to be healed. A number of years ago, I led a Bible study, and it was called, I think I called it Jesus at the Movies or something like that. And what we did is we looked at a number of films that Hollywood has produced over the years <coughs> that, that in some way uh, show us the life of Jesus. And what we did is we compared and contrasted the story of Jesus in the Gospels with how it was portrayed in these various films. And one of the films that we looked at was the 70s music class, musical classic, uh, Jesus Christ Superstar. And maybe some of you have seen that, and even if you haven't, uh, maybe you've heard the soundtrack from it. Kind of an interesting movie, and, and you watch it, you can say, yep, that's a 70s movie for sure. But there's a scene that, that I still remember vividly. And if you've seen the movie, you might recall it as well. But what happens is Jesus is surrounded by all these sick people and all of their illness and all of their deformity. And they're, and they're, they're just mobbing him, really. And you get to the point in this, in the film where they're, they're literally crawling out of caves and rocks in all of their rags and all of their sickness. And, and they're just getting closer and closer to Jesus. And initially what happens is Jesus, with lots of confidence and care and power, is healing them. But they just keep coming until finally, and the music is getting more and more frantic and frenetic, Jesus himself, in kind of a, a, a high-pitched you know, cry, calls out. He says, leave me alone. You're pushing me. There's too many of you. There's too little of me. Now, we might be able to identify with that if we were in a crowd of people with all of that need around us. But when you actually compare that scene in the movie to what we see of Jesus in the Gospels, I got to say it is the most unchrist like scene in the whole film. There's some other scenes that are, I think, a little bit uh, better. And, and help us envision what was going on in Jesus' ministry. This isn't one of them. This does not get it right. And it certainly does not show us what was going on in our text today where we are specifically told that as Jesus sees this crowd, his response is compassion. A few weeks ago when we were looking at John chapter 9, we read the same thing. Jesus looked at the people, and in that case, it, it seems that the, it was is more the spiritual need that Jesus was responding to. And it said, he looked at them with compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Well, now you get the same thing, with compassion. And then it says that he healed them. Now, this is a big thing. This is not just the compassion of anybody. This isn't just someone's pity because they feel bad that there's all these six people. This, this is the very mercy and pity and compassion of God Almighty himself who encounters the needs of his people. And I want you to notice, it's not just that Jesus is concerned about their spiritual needs. Of course he's concerned about that. But he is specifically concerned here, it says, with these physical needs that they have. And we want to remember that, that the compassion of Jesus is directed at the whole person. And that means your person too. That means your spiritual needs and your physical needs as well. That the compassion of Jesus and his salvation extends to all of creation. And that in the end, his whole creation and your whole self, body and soul together, will be restored and made whole as was intended at the beginning of creation. But we're not at the end of the story yet, are we? 
We're not at the end of this world when everything that is broken will finally be restored and made whole. In the meantime, what God wants us to do is to rest in the promise that his compassion is going to make all things right. And in the meantime, then, what he would have us do is, is rest in his promise, but then he would also have us as his church take our own cues from his compassion for people in all of their very real physical needs. That we would do what we might do as his people today in meeting those needs as best we can. There's been a, an endeavor that our church body has been involved in, just as an example of this, over the last uh, several years. It's uh, been a malaria initiative, and it's a, a part of uh, an, an attempt, and it's not just on the part of our own church body, but all kinds of churches have been involved in this as well, trying to eradicate malaria uh, in, in Africa. And I just ran across an interesting statistic on this. And in fact, I, I tried to find out a little bit more about it. I, I couldn't. I, I, it's almost hard to believe that this statistic just has to do with Africa, although it's possible. But here's what it said. Is that before all of this began, it was estimated that something like um, one child died from malaria every two seconds. That's pretty bad, isn't it? One child every two seconds, on average. And over the years, because of this particular initiative, and mainly it's been, one of the main things has been providing mosquito nets, just to keep kids from being bitten by mosquitoes at night. I mean, a lot of the mortality is, is infant child mortality from malaria. And so just providing mosquito nets and protecting children at night when they're sleeping has made this kind of difference, that that, that's, that death rate has gone from something like two child deaths every two seconds to two child deaths every two minutes, which is still pretty bad. But at the same time, that means 29 lives saved from malaria per minute. And God cares for every one of those lives. And in this case, God is extending his compassion to those very lives in part through his church as well as other organizations. And so the church has always, always understood this, that yes, God is concerned about our spiritual well-being, but God's concern extends to the whole self, the whole person. And so the church has always been involved in these kinds of works of mercy. And, and our congregation is, of course, involved in those sorts of things as well. Back to the text, though. As, the te as this day of healing moves on, what happens is that a new need arises. It's getting close to the end of the day, and they're out in this middle of nowhere, and there's no food to eat. So the disciples come to Jesus, and they tell him, hey, you got to send the crowds away because there's nothing to eat around here. And so have them go out to the surrounding you know, villages. This is one of those instances where you have the disciples in this role of sort of acting like Captain Obvious, if, if you know what I mean. You have these occasions where the disciples tell Jesus something as if he were completely unaware of it. As if the one who is paying attention to these needs of the people doesn't realize, hey, we're out in the middle of nowhere and there's nothing to eat. It's kind of like when they wake him up and say, hey, don't you care? There's a storm. As if Jesus, the Lord of all things, is, is unaware of what's taking place around him. At any rate, they, they tell him this. Now, it's not that the disciples are being heartless. It's not that the disciples don't have a care or concern for the people in their need. They do. And that's why they say, hey, Jesus, let's send them away to get something to eat. You know, hey, folks, the day is over. We're very glad that Jesus has, uh, has healed your loved one of, you know, the blindness or the deafness or the paralysis or the demon possession, whatever it was. Day's over now. Why don't you go on and get something to eat and we'll see you next time uh, Jesus is, is, uh, is here in the area. And so that's what they tell Jesus. Just send him away, Lord. And Jesus responds by saying, no, you give him something to eat. Have you ever felt like the disciples must have felt in that moment? A little bit confused? Lord, I hear the words, I hear what you're saying, 
but I don't see how it's going to happen. What you're asking is impossible. There is no way that I can do this. And of course, what the, what the disciples are being asked by Jesus to do is actually too much for them. But who have they been with all day long? They've been right there with Jesus throughout the whole day. They have seen him miraculously time after time heal someone else of some particular malady. And it's not as though they had not once seen Jesus turn water into wine. And yet here they are one more time in this kind of circumstance and they don't know what to do. You know what their response should have been? It should have been something like this. Okay, Jesus, let's feed them. You give us the food. We'll hand it out. John MacArthur, if you know who John MacArthur is, he says they're a little bit like a guy dying of thirst at Niagara Falls and saying, does anybody know where you can get a drink of water around here? They have Jesus, the source of, of all the power and provision in the universe, standing right there. And it doesn't even cross their mind that he might have something planned. To provide for the people. They just don't see it. Isn't that just like us? You think about all the times that we don't see it. You know, we've been cared for so many times. We've been supplied by Jesus so many times to do those things that he's called us to do. But some new crisis comes up. Some new need in somebody's life or the life of the church or the life of society and and. and we're called to meet it in some way, and we don't see how Jesus might provide for us. Our practicality kicks in, just like they, they're being practical. Just send them away so they can find something to eat. Our practicality kicks in too. It can't be done. Along with that, don't you think that sometimes this is the problem? That we don't, we don't have the same kind of compassion that Jesus does. The need is there, the brokenness, the hunger, the, the physical and the spiritual need, but we don't see people the way that Jesus sees them. And sometimes, because we don't, we're not very earnest in looking to him to provide for us that we might provide for others. We don't value people the way that we, the way that we should or the way that Jesus does. We don't have that same kind of compassion. Guy was given a, a seminar to a bunch of business people, and he, he starts it off with a crisp $20 bill in his hand, and he holds it up, and he says, uh, you know, who wants a nice, crisp $20 bill? And of course, people's hands go up. Who didn't want a free $20 bill? And then he crumples it up in his hand, and uh, he says, who, who wants it now? Everybody's hand stays up, and so he drops it on the ground, and he steps on it with the sole of his shoe and kind of grinds it into the ground. He stoops down, he picks it up. Who wants it now? Hands stay up. Maybe a few go down, but, but for each of those people with their hands still up, you know what we all know, that that $20 still had value to them. And in a similar way, we might say this, that Christ values the fallen and the broken, the needy people all around us. He, he sees them through his own eyes, even though we might see them perhaps not as of much value to us. Those sometimes who we might drop is hardly worth our time. Jesus still values them. And on top of that, he values us even though we have so often ourselves perhaps devalued others or have ground ourselves into the filth of our own sinful choices or have been ground down by the sinful choices of others or just by life and by circumstance. But Jesus' compassion shows us that he sees us as, as treasure in his sight. Now back to the text. The disciples bring to him their meager supply, their five little loaves of bread and their two fish. And Jesus seats the crowd. He offers up a blessing. And then he disperses the disciples with the food to feed the people. Feeds them all. Isn't it amazing what Jesus is willing to do 
even though he was never even asked. Disciples didn't ask him. And it doesn't appear that the, that the crowd asked him either. My, my guess would be that the crowds uh, would not have all been surprised if Jesus would have said, well, it's been great being with you. Go on, get yourself something to eat. Disperse, you know, the day is over. He's not asked, but he's still willing to do it. Just as he was willing to heal those who in all of their need deprived him of this opportunity for rest or privacy. He feeds them even though it would have been understandable if he would have sent them away. But he's willing. And this is what we find over and over and over again with Jesus. The, the willingness of Jesus to serve. Of course, he was willing to come from heaven to earth. He was willing to suffer on the cross and die. He was buried. He ascended. He hears our prayers. He saves our own sorry souls. And he's compassionate with us in a million different ways every day. It says, when all who ate, you know, it finished, they were satisfied. And that's like Jesus too. It's not just that he feeds them, but they are fed and they're filled. And then there's 12 baskets left over. What should you make of 12 baskets? Well, 12 disciples all adds up, doesn't it? When you are serving in the name of Christ, when you are answering Christ's call to serve other people in your life, when you're loving your family, that's where it begins, when, when you're caring for your neighbor in some way, and, and maybe especially when you're doing so and you feel like your task is not being appreciated. You know, may, maybe it's just as simple as being patient with somebody who it's hard to be patient with when you're caring for someone who, who doesn't even care that you care? Does it ever cross your mind, hey, what about me? Who's taking care of me? Who's serving me? Those 12 baskets remind you, Jesus has not forgotten you. He does provide for you as you serve in his name. And it's not because you and I have everything together, not because we figured it all out no more than the disciples had. It's simply this, that Jesus loves the world, and that means you, and it means me too. What do you think? The, the moments of mercy are for you this coming week, that, that Jesus is calling you to. What do you think those acts of compassion might be for you that Jesus will... Uh, have already prepared for you to do? What practicality in you and me might dampen our compassion? Or what practicality in us might blind us to the compassion and the power of Jesus? Or what desolate place might we find our own selves in? What hunger might we experience in our lives, physical or spiritual? That's why we're here. We're here to be fed. And we're here to be filled. And Jesus feeds us. And he fills us. He fills us with his word and with his spirit. In just a, a little bit, we're going to be standing up here at the communion rail. He'll be feeding you with bread and wine, with his own body and blood. As you come in repentant faith, remembering his compassion for all of your need, his forgiveness for all of your sin, knowing this, that he feeds and strengthens you in body and soul for the week ahead and for life everlasting. Amen. Now may this word keep you steadfast in the true faith until life everlasting. Amen. Let's rise now as we continue by confessing our Christian faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we have sought meaning, comfort, and sustenance from all the wrong places. Grant us your Holy Spirit that our hearts may be turned to your word, that we may hunger for your Son's body and blood, and that we may discern truth from error. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we give you thanks that you have blessed us beyond what we deserve and given to us your church. Guard her life by your spirit and strengthen her witness before the nations. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we too quickly focus on what we lack and not upon your unlimited grace. Bless all relief agencies and services of your church on behalf of the hungry, the homeless, the hurting, those who have lost hope. Bless those visited by disaster and tragedy and open our hearts to help them recover from their loss. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we are daily blessed to know abundance and freedom. Bless those who defend us from our enemies, who serve us in government and who protect us in our communities. Be with our president, the Congress, our governor, our judges and magistrates, that they may discern the right path and lead us with honor and integrity. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we suffer with all manner of ills and afflictions. Hear us and grant to us healing according to your will, strength in time of trial and peace at the last. We would pray especially for Ron Weigert, Aaron Blevins, Carol Brazy, Susan Hatfield, Pastor Boy, Josh Darby, Jamie Klein, Brianna Hoffman, Lauren Streiner, Renee Batt, and Marilyn Walker, and those named in our hearts. Good Lord, deliver us and teach us to depend upon your grace in all things. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, we know that your steadfast love and mercy are forever, but our faith is daily tested and tempted. Give us strength and endurance that we may not despair, but have confidence in your sufficient grace. Guide us to seek our consolation in your word and sacraments and prepare us to receive the Lord's body and blood in this holy communion. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we are daily and richly surrounded with your love and care. Grant us eyes to see your mercies new every morning and grateful hearts that what we have received we may share with those in need and generously support the work of your church. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we ask you to grant us all things needful and keep from us all things harmful to us and to our salvation, for we trust your wisdom and your love. Teach us to pray without fear. Your will be done through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Have you ever bought something? <laughs> Doesn't it feel great? You go in and you pick out the thing that you want, maybe a candy bar or a toy car, and, and you take it to the register and they scan it, and then they, they tell you the price and you take out your dollar bill and you put it on the counter. Oh, it feels great to have enough money to buy something, especially something that we want. But what would happen if we went up to the cash register to buy that candy bar or that toy car and we didn't have any money? Well, yeah, we wouldn't be able to buy it. We wouldn't be able to complete the transaction. If you want to buy something, you have to have the money to pay for it. And not just money for buying things. There are other things that we know we earn. Maybe we think about how we can earn a later bedtime by being able to not get cranky when we get tired. Or maybe we consider how we earn friends by being kind and sharing. We know that we live in a world where if we want something, we have to do something for it. And then we hear these words today from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 55 says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Wait, what? How can you buy if you don't have any money? Well, this passage is talking about God's love for us, for you and for me. He daily gives us the things that we need to live, food and water, home and family. So what do we have to do to earn that? 
maybe it's putting enough offering in the offering plate on the way out the church doors. Maybe it's making sure that we make at least two church services a month. Maybe that's what God needs from us. Perhaps if we promise to behave better or use nicer language or, or listen better to our parents, then God will give us those good gifts. Nope. That's not how God's love works. As Isaiah 55 says, he gives his love and his gifts for free. In church, we use a fancy word to describe that. The, the, to describe these free gifts, we say it's God's grace. Grace is, is gifts that are given for free. Gifts that we don't have the money or the good works to buy. God's grace comes mostly in the person of Jesus who came to earth and died on the cross and, and rose again and in doing so gives to you and me the free gift of eternal life, of life with him forever. Today, we remember that we have a God who gives us gifts that we can't buy or earn. A God who loves us and gives us grace. Will you pray with me? Repeat after me, say, Dear God, thank you for giving us grace. Gifts that we can't earn. In Jesus' name we pray.